Good morning. Welcome to uh, God's house again this morning, this uh, sixth Sunday of Easter. Um, as we bring God's house into your house again uh, via our YouTube channel. So, welcome. The message today is based on our, our second reading, our epistle reading from 1 Peter, which talks about hope. Something that we all need to hear about these days. Through his resurrection from the dead, Jesus has become our principal hope. Through Christ, God has made his salvation known to us. Now the Lord would have us witness in our daily lives to the living hope that is ours in Jesus. Peter encourages, always, encourages us always to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Thankfully, we're not alone in our witness because as we hear in the gospel reading, God did not leave us as orphans, but sent the spirit of truth to be with us forever. Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. Alleluia! We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that, that he might bring us to God. God. In faith, we come before our Lord in confession. Almighty and merciful God, we confess, we confess to you that we are sinful, sinful by nature. nature unrighteous and separated from you. We have sinned against you by our selfish thoughts, our unkind words, and our unloving actions. We so often neglect devotion to your word and the gifts of your spirit. We have not kept your commandments, and in so doing have failed to show our love for you. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, forgive us. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus' suffering and death for us, he has brought us to God and declared us righteous. Because he lives, we also shall live. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you promise to give what we ask in the name of your only Son. Give us, we pray, your Holy Spirit, the Helper. Give us new life and hope. Give us the grace to trust you alone. In all that we ask, teach us rightly to pray. Then with all your saints, we will offer you our adoration and praise. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and rules with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading for this Sunday is from uh, Paul's letter, or St. Peter's first letter, chapter 3, verses 13 to 22. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey 
when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds this to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Here ends the reading. The gospel for this Sunday is from John's gospel once again, chapter 14, beginning at verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, boys and girls. Thanks for coming today. I know you're not really here, but I'm talking to you in your living room today, so pay attention. When was the last time you hoped for something? Eh, maybe it was for your birthday or maybe last Christmas. Like maybe a doll or a, a toy 
toy fire truck or maybe, maybe a puppy or a brand new bike or a smartphone. Maybe you hoped to go back to school. Probably not last Christmas, but maybe now you're getting tired of staying at home. So uh, what does it mean to hope for something? Well, sometimes we, it's kind of like a wish to us, but the Bible says more about hope, especially in our reading for today from 1 Peter that I just read. Peter says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Well, what did Peter mean by that? That's a good Lutheran question. What does this mean? Well, what, why do we Christians have hope? And in what? Well, the song that we just sang has the words in it, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So ultimately, our hope is that we will be able to go to heaven someday. And it's not because we've been such good boys and girls and good, good adults and good pastor, because we all fall short of God's expectations there. But that's why he sent Jesus to go to the cross to die for our sins. But he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose again. And we're still celebrating that. This is the sixth week now, and we'll have one more week where we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. That's where our hope ultimately is for this life and for the life to come. Thank you, boys and girls. The message today is the, the reason for hope. The Bible has a lot to say about hope, and hope is certainly something that we need a lot of these days. But let me begin with an, an opening illustration. There's an old Chinese parable about a poor man who lived with his son in an abandoned fort. They owned one horse that they depended on to haul vegetables to town. It was their only means of support. Well, one day the horse ran away. When the neighbors heard about it, they went to the old man and expressed their sympathy. Too bad, they said. How do you know it's too bad, the old man replied. The horse returned and brought a dozen wild horses back with him. The neighbor said, well, that's good. How do you know it's good, the man asked. When my son tried to tame the horses, he broke his leg. That's bad, they said, very bad. Well, how do you know that, the old man replied. Shortly after that, a war broke out, but my son was injured, so he didn't have to go to the front line. Well, different events by themselves are often seen as bad or even hopeless. Recent history has provided more than our share of those kinds of events that probably seem hopeless to people involved. Can you imagine what it was like to have lost a loved one in the attacks of 9-11 in 2001? It's hard to believe that's almost 20 years ago. Oh, we finally got bin Laden, but most people would agree that our world has changed forever. And until this March, hardly a day went by without something in the news about the war on terror. Can you imagine what it was like to have lost a loved one in the tsunami in Thailand? More than 200,000 people were killed in a matter of hours. Survivors were in a state of shock. Who could blame them for feeling hopeless? Can you imagine what it would be like to have your house blown away by a tornado? Some of the parishioners in my first church 
back in Albion, Pennsylvania, know what that's like. Can you imagine what it must be like to have your home and farm immersed and washed away by a flood? And you know that it's coming for days. Well, that happened while we were at the seminary in St. Louis. It rained upstream in the headwaters of the Missouri and the Mississippi River for weeks. And unlike a hurricane, the floodwaters wouldn't turn and go somewhere else. In the end, they had to open up the floodgates to save the levees protecting the towns. I can't imagine feeling more hopeless. Well, now we find ourselves under attack by this sub-microscopic enemy this new coronavirus. Will I get it? If I do, will I recover? Well, the whole world is hunkered down in fear. Fear for our lives, fear of losing our home or a business, fear for where our next meal will come from. We see images in the news of brave caregivers in hazmat suits tending to people on ventilators. We see heartbreaking pleas for survivor's plasma or the latest experimental drug. I've personally seen homeless men in my neighborhood going through the trash before the waste management truck gets there to find something that they can recycle to make a few bucks and survive. We have to limit the virus's spread, and we have to get back to work safely. But in all of these natural or man-made disasters, it's very easy to find yourself asking, what's the world coming to? That's an expression of despair or hopelessness. Let me ask you a question. What does it take for someone to have hope? One of my seminary professors told us that you need two things. First, you need a past to build on. And second, you need a future to anticipate. Without a solid foundation to build on, hope has nothing to give it substance. It seems more like wishful thinking that won't hold up under pressure. But without a future, hope has nothing to look forward to. In either case, hope shrivels and dies, since it's either a false hope or no hope at all. But that's exactly where so many people find themselves in our country today. In the good old days, America had a strong past to build on and things looked pretty promising for for even greater progress in the future. Then the turbulent 60s, the self-centered 70s, and the greedy 80s hit. And I don't know what nickname they gave in the 90s, but then came the decade of the War on Terror. A whole generation of Americans either questioned our past or simply forgot about it. There are some good signs that young people are returning to the values of their grandparents, but many are still troubled and reliving the mistakes of their parents, from drugs to sex to broken families. Many people look at the future with fear, from economics to morals, and now the pandemic. What's the world going to look like? So they live mainly in the present, and hope has shrunk. Only today seems to matter to many. And that that eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die attitude is all around us. As Christians, 
It's hard not to be influenced by this loss of hope in our society. It's all too easy to get caught up in the mood of pessimism and look at the world with tunnel vision and wonder where God has been. But just like that Chinese parable, no failure, loss, or suffering stands alone. All through his first letter, Peter speaks to his hearers about suffering. Not from wars, natural disasters, or disease, but suffering that Christians were beginning to experience because of their faith. Yet in every case, the hardship had a positive result and led to a greater good. So Peter urges his readers to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Earlier, earlier in this letter, Peter reminded them to pay attention to the word of God, that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Their hope was kept alive and strengthened as they meditated on God's word. You see, God's word helps us to keep things in perspective. As St. Paul wrote to the church at Rome, everything that was written in the past, that is the Old Testament, was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. There's that word hope again. In the Bible, we see again and again that God doesn't give up even when the situation seems hopeless, to his people anyway. Remember Joseph in the Egyptian prison. Remember Moses at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army closing in from behind. Remember the boy David versus the giant Goliath. Or the exile in Babylon when the temple had been destroyed and they were there for more than two generations. Remember Daniel in the lion's den, the three men in the fiery furnace, and it goes on. But the most hopeless situation of all was Jesus, the Son of God, nailed to the cross on Good Friday or so it seemed. We know better now. Peter was writing to encourage new Christians who were facing persecution for their faith. But his inspired words still apply to us today. He declares that we in the church do have hope. A hope that those outside the church will notice. I just saw an article, in, came in a newsletter in the mail yesterday about how the, ch the church has been dealing with pandemics for thousands of years. There was a major pandemic during the Roman Empire and the Christians actually cared for people so much that even the Roman emperors commented about how they were doing a better job than the Roman citizens. And people noticed. And they'll notice today your act of kindness. And they might even find it attractive and want to know, why do you still have hope in all of this? Where does this hope come from? Well, first of all, it comes from the past. And besides all those Old Testament examples of God's rescue, we know that Christ died once for all, the righteous and the unrighteous. We also know that Christ has risen from the dead. He died to bring us to God. 
he descended into hell to proclaim his victory over the forces that would attack our hope in him. And that victory is ours in our baptism. We've been saved by Jesus' resurrection, and our baptism has applied that benefit to us. As we just sang in that uh, old favorite hymn with a new melody, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Where else does our hope come from? It also comes from our future. Our hope looks beyond death. Certainly, we will die. If the coronavirus doesn't get me, something else will get me down the road. As I think it was George Bernard Shaw said, none of us are getting out of here alive. At least in our earthly bodies. We all will die. Death might even come tomorrow, but that possibility isn't the end of the story. Our future is bright and certain. Even suffering now can't destroy Christian hope, because just as Christ was made alive again, so too he is able to bring us to God in eternal glory in heaven. That's the second reason for our hope. And then Peter urges us to always be prepared to share the reason for our hope to anyone who asks, but to do it with gentleness and respect. You see, Peter had learned that words harshly spoken, even if they're true, push people away and they, they quit listening. But besides the witness of our words, the witness of our lifestyle is also necessary and may be even more effective than words. Our witness is urgent. It may be the only time that person we know gets to hear the good news about salvation and eternal life through faith in Jesus. Since God works through his word, you and I can be effective witnesses to the hope that we have, even though it may not seem to produce any results right away. Since God will have the last word, we don't give up on sharing that good news. Christian hope is ours. In the midst of so much lost hope around us, the church still has the only lasting reason for hope-filled lives. The Boy Scout motto says, be prepared. So like good scouts, we always try to be prepared to talk about this hope that we have to others who ask us, how in the world can we still have hope in spite of all the bad news around us? With Christ as Lord in our hearts, we share the reason for our hope with gentleness and respect, with our words and with our lives. Amen. Let us join together and confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time, it is our privilege to come before the Lord in a time of prayer. 
I would draw your attention to the uh, prayer list that uh, was, if you have one sent out to you, we'll have a prayer list on there. We would encourage you to provide us with any updates that need to be, whether people need to be added or people need to be removed from the prayer list because their prayers have been answered. And if those prayers are answered, we want to include a prayer of thanksgiving for those answered prayers. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you once again for your word, and especially today in the appointed lesson that speaks of hope, the hope that ultimately comes from you for this life and for the life to come. Lord, help us to stay grounded in your word, to remember all the examples of your delivery and rescue from people in times that seem so hopeless throughout the Old Testament and ultimately in Jesus' own death and then resurrection that we still celebrate today. That is the ultimate reason for our hope. Thank you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, we also lift up to you our church, this congregation and its school, our sister congregations in the Florida, Georgia district, and our own Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and the church around the world as we all struggle to be faithful to you and to serve our neighbors as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, it is our privilege to remember those who have requested prayers on their behalf. Lord, that list is printed or included in our email list. Lord, we mention each person in our hearts by name, at least those that we are personally familiar with. And we simply ask your loving care to provide what is best for each person that's on that list. Lord, you know what they need in body, mind, and spirit better than we do ourselves. So we simply entrust each of those individuals into your loving care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we join together in the words that Jesus, our Lord, himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is, he is risen, risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia! Go in peace, serve, serve the Lord. Lord.
Good morning once again. We have one important announcement to share with you. Um, as you know, we've had a, uh, a task force putting together a checklist of things that we need to do uh, in the event that whenever we're able to open again. Uh, and they met last Wednesday and uh, finalized a, a very detailed list of the things that we need to do to, to keep the church safe when that happens. And as, as things happen, uh, Broward County has decided to uh, allow some limited opening things to open uh, this coming Monday. So uh, we are prepared to announce that we will be opening for church again on May 31st, which happens to be Pentecost Sunday. And what the task force was done was ask the question, try to answer the question, what will church worship in church be like when we open again? And our underlying premise was that we need to do everything we can to help people be safe and feel safe from the coronavirus if we expect people to come to church and to be able to worship without fear and distractions. So before opening, we will do everything we can to make sure that everything is clean, especially the high touch areas like door handles, limit the number of entrances to the building. If you are sick, please stay home. Let us know so we can pray for you. Everyone will need to wear a, mat, a cloth mask if possible, and we will have some masks available to pass out. And we will be maintaining physical distancing, at least six foot separation. Therefore, we will rope off the alternate rows and we will usher people to their seats. Families living in the same house can certainly sit together and we will expect three chair separation in those rows where seating is allowed. We believe under those conditions that the maximum seating capacity then is about 65 people in the sanctuary. Uh, both traditional and contemporary services will be held in the sanctuary and on that first Sunday, May 31st, since we have not had communion in a long time, we will celebrate Holy Communion at both services on May 31st. Obviously, there are more details than we want to go into here in this announcement, so we will be sending out the detailed information uh, on a separate, a separate email. But one important last note, if you are in a higher risk group and you don't feel safe coming to church with a bunch of people around, no matter how much you miss seeing them, that's okay. We will continue to bring church to your house via the internet and or and YouTube, whether it's live or recorded, or with a personal visit to your house at your request by appointment. I won't just show up at your door and expect you to invite me in. Finally, we need to pray for God's continued protection and for his guidance as we move forward the rest of the summer and into the new school year and beyond. God bless you and keep you safe.